Welcome to the Courage Barbell Unlimited Podcast with your host, legendary powerlifter and strength athlete, Chad Ikes. For most, the journey of strength starts in the gym, but should inevitably expand through all aspects of life. Join us as we discuss all things strength. Now, here's your host, Chad Ikes. Hello, people out there in, I don't know, podcast world. So, as any of you know that that follow this podcast, you know that it's probably been, shit, I don't know, a month, maybe two months since I did a video, or a podcast video. Uh, Brings up a question. If you guys would like me to record these for YouTube and do a video, let me know, and I will check into that process. So, basically, I was, I have a really good tendency to implode or explode myself. I have the ability to push myself way beyond anything that I can handle. And it's taken me a long, long, long time to even come close to mastering this. So basically over the last couple months, it's just, I was traveling a lot. A lot of stuff was going on. Uh, I ended up where I wasn't recovering from my tra- training, my depression was no, nothing like it has been in the past, but, but it was, shit was happening that I wasn't happy about, and I just had to put the brakes on, and I had to go back to, wait a minute, like, I need to make a living, I need to focus on the things that pay my living, and I need to focus on my health. I think one of the things that a lot of people tend to forget or not understand, when you're healthy and you feel good, you get a lot more accomplished in a lot less time. And you do a better job. And your mind is clearer. You make better decisions. I can guarantee you I make absolutely horrible decisions when I'm suffering from depression. And they seem very logical and they seem to make a lot of sense during the time. But then I look back and go, wow, that was completely and utterly stupid. So basically what I did coming into coming into this, those couple months is I, I started noticing all these things were happening and I noticed changes in myself and I went, wait a minute, like you need to put the brakes on and you need to get yourself healthy. Cause even you could, you could, I could have kept going. I could have kept putting stuff out, but the quality would have continued to decline and I would have kept pushing myself further and further. And I would have ended up down the rabbit hole of depression and screwed upness where nothing was actually going good. And then I would have been shit for six months to a year. So even that being said, there's been a couple weeks where I'm like, all right, I need to get, I'm getting better. Things are going good. I need to get back to doing the podcast. And stuff just kept coming up where I'm like, man, I just don't really feel like it. And like, actually today I just got home from the grocery store and I went, man, I just want to sit down and eat dinner and watch TV. And I thought, no, screw that. Like, you feel fine. Get your ass in gear and get a podcast done. So I'm asking you all to bear with me a little bit because I'm doing this podcast on a whim, basically. I'm like, no, you need to get one going. You need to get started again. Just do one. And so I don't have this huge plan of what I wanted to talk about today. I don't have actually any notes, any thoughts. I mean, I'm just here I am. But I think a good thing to talk about is the depression and is how that affects us in training and life and everything else. And I don't, I assume everyone knows me if you're listening to this, but that might not be the case. Um, Or maybe you know of me, but you don't know my history. I suffered from sleep issues from about fifth grade through my whole life. I have not stayed awake in a classroom since fifth grade. I've always had trouble with my energy and with my sleep 
for years and years and years, I just thought everyone slept like shit. I thought everyone was up all night. I thought that was normal and I just needed to toughen up and deal with being tired. And it wasn't until I started powerlifting and I got bigger and I developed apnea. And then everything came to this huge head and, and I ended up finally getting checked out and we get, put me on a CPAP to fix the apnea and we still look at through the sleep studies and they're like, man, something's still screwed up here. And basically I do not get hardly any deep sleep, which is the most important sleep. And I don't sleep for long periods of time when my sleeps, when my sleep itself is kind of shitty if I'm in bed eight hours, I might get three hours of actual sleep. No delta, no deep delta sleep. Um, I will get some REM and, and, and light sleep. And I'm up and down all night long. Like it's rarely am I asleep longer than a half hour to 45 minutes. When it's good, in an eight hour time span, I can get six, maybe six and a half. I think there's been times where I've gotten seven, but it's pretty rare. And then I'll get 15 or 20 minutes of deep sleep. And that's just the way... It's been for me, and that it actually ranged into insomnia, where the longest I've ever been up was somewhere between 11 and 14 days. I can't say for sure because the world got really, really weird, um, and I don't know after that. But I've ranged with insomnia. There was a time in my life where staying up for two or three days was easy. Like I was so used to it, it wasn't even a problem. Uh, meaning I could deal with it. I could function. My functioning was shit. But I could function that way. And along with that, I've had a lifetime of different intensities of depression ranging to some very serious suicidal, I don't know what you want to say. Like, I mean, I'm still here, thank God, or thank the universe or whoever you want to thank. Um, <laughs> that inner ember of light that's inside of me. But I was very close a lot of times. Just, it was hard to find a reason not to just end all the pain because there was nothing good and I couldn't see anything good. That was one of the reasons, that was the reason why I stopped competing at the highest levels in powerlifting was I was just pushing it too hard and my friends, my family, my team, it got to a point where everybody was pulling me to the side going, you need to stop. Like you're not going to, you're not going to live another year if you don't stop. And we went through a lot and it took me a long time. And at this point I haven't suffered from what I call clinical depression in years. I haven't had insomnia in years. I mean, my worst nights, I still get a couple hours of sleep, which is good. And depression-wise, I still have my ups and downs, no doubt. Like I said, coming into this one, things were happening, but I've learned my triggers and I've learned to go, all right, that's it, man. I got to pull back. Like my health is more important than anything. So if I got to pull back from a few things, then I got to pull back from it. And I'm still working to, I'm trying to modify my life to a point where I can really have the best handle on all this stuff. And where I can have a lot of enjoyment and do a lot of the hobbies that I love and, and, and be there for more people in my life. Uh, going back to the sleep. The sleep's an interesting one because, like I said, for so many years I had no idea. Like, I just thought that's the way it was. And I remember I've had some psychologists look at all my sleep stuff and go, wow, like, we don't know what else to do. And I've had multiple sleep doctors tell me, well, that's, that's it. That's the best we can do. I've even had, I've had sleep doctors go, well, why are you here today? And I'm like, cause you have my file. Like I'm here cause I want my sleep. I want to sleep. I want to get normal sleep. And she's like, well, there's nothing we can do. Why'd you come in? And even my, the last sleep doctor I had was actually really cool. And, uh, he's like, man, Chad, <laughs> I had a meeting. I pulled all the doctors in the clinic together. We looked over your file. We don't know what to do. We don't po We don't have any idea what we could do to help you. You know, he's like, we. you have narcolepsy. We've tried all the different medications. Nothing's worked. 
were stumped. But he's like, you through this whole time we've seen you, like you've had all these ideas and concepts and you're very intelligent about what's going on. And he's like, if there's ever anything you want to try, or there's any medication, if there's anything, if you have any ideas, let us know and we will help you through that as much as we can. Which was actually, which was pretty cool. I mean, it's better just going, fuck you. There's nothing we can do. Get out of here. Um, so I think my sleep is what it is. I still think I can improve it. If I could just get it back to where I was in my 20s, my early 20s, I would be ecstatic. And I think I'm moving in that direction. The problem is I have these little ups and downs, um, such as like the last week. Or the last, I mean, before I pulled back on doing all these podcasts. And the depression, I mean, the depression has been about as low as you can go and still come back from it, I think. But even that's, that's, it's getting better. Um, and I'm learning how to deal with it. And I think one of the biggest things with that is learning my triggers and learning how my body responds to stuff. And basically going, listen, it's not, it's not about not being able to handle certain situations. It's about the fact that your body can only recover so much. And that's different in everybody. It's nothing about your character. It's nothing about who you are. It's just something that happens. And that that's always been a, a huge hit for me. And I'll try to get into that one a little bit later. Um, but that's where I'm at. That's where I'm here. I thought over the past few months... <laughs> And thinking back to some, a lot of other stuff in my hit, my past and the people, the clients that I've trained and my teammates that I trained, I had this thought the other day and I have this, this is like a recurring thought for me. So I've had them a lot, but sometimes it, sometimes when I slow down and I really just try to contemplate and run my own thought experiments, this will come back up. And I think a lot of times in life, we feel like we have no control, like shit just happens. And the fact is, shit does just happen, but how you react to it is your choice. You always have a choice. And I look back in my sleep and my depression and I go, wow, if I had not experienced these things, there's no way I would know as much about them as I do. And there's no way I could have helped as many people as I've helped. There's no way I would be where I'm at today. Like those things are kind of a gift. For example, when I, when I was training my team, when I was competing at my heaviest, I, I always watched my team. We always had really good, I made sure we had the habit of, Seeing how everyone's doing and not just like, well, how are they lifting? What are their numbers? I mean, who are they? What, how is their life going? How are they feeling? And so my team would always ask, and it's funny because my team was super intense and we critiqued each other so hard and people in the gym were like, they're kind of assholes. Like, I don't want to train with them. They're too intense, but I'm still friends with all, with all of my teammates today. They're still, we're all still family. But you would come in and, and everyone on the team would be like, how you feeling, man? And we'd all be looking at each other and just be like, how's your sleep? How's your appetite? How's things at home? You getting along with your wife? How are your kids doing? And, you know, you've been doing your mobility. How's your stretching going? And these were all questions to see how they were doing as a person, to see how is their central nervous system recovering? How are their muscles recovering? You know, all these are signs that we need to pay attention to, to adjust their training. And one of those big questions was, how was your sleep? And I noticed over time, all of my teammates slept normal. In fact, some of them slept great. Like people tell me they wake up once a night or just they go to bed and then it's morning. Like that's unfathomable to me because that's happened maybe four times in my life that I can remember. It just doesn't happen to me. And I'm, ext I'm extremely jealous of people that do that. 
but what I noticed is that when they started overtraining, it would affect their sleep. And so there would be, there were, there was always multiple signs and it was basically, it's like, okay, you have three of my major signs that you're overtraining. You're deloading. Depending on the very severity of it, you may not be doing nothing for a week or two. But one of the key things with sleep was I noticed is that they would start waking up a lot. And they wouldn't have long spurts of sleep or they couldn't sleep through the night. And I was like, wow, that's like my best nights are like that. And as my sleep gets worse, that gets worse. And then my depression gets worse. So whenever I heard him say that, I'd be like, all right, you, that's it, man. You're deloading the rest of the week and maybe next week. And basically, the first night that they go, man, I slept really good last night. I'm ready to go. And I'm like, no, no, no. You're not ready to go. Go ahead and take another three days. Then you can start training again. Because that first night that you start sleeping good, you're, you're still on the cusp. You can still be shot back into shit really easily. So we would go a little longer than that. And then, bam, they, they, everything would go great. Their training would go great. They would get stronger. And this happened repeatedly over the years, and it happened with everyone that I trained. And I noticed everybody kind of takes this very similar path to their sleep getting off. And the funny thing is, is if I didn't go through what I went through, they would have never noticed it. I would have never noticed it. I can't tell you how many people I talk to about sleep and their sleep is absolutely horrible, but they don't recognize it because it happens so gradually. And they're so caught up that I got to train more. I got to train more. I got to go harder. I got to go harder. And all they're really doing is messing themselves up. And then as their sleep gets worse, they'll start dealing with some depression. With most people, it might not be that bad. But even they're getting agitated with their spouses or their kids or their job, and everything's getting more and more irritated. And they, they just go down this tunnel, and it's a snowball effect. And then before you know it, they're making horrible, dumb decisions that they wouldn't have made if they were feeling good. So me living on this, this cusp and having to learn all this stuff, it forced me to educate myself. It forced me, well, maybe it didn't even, it, for, for my personality, it forced me because I'm like, I, it, I have to do something. I have to learn. I have to educate myself. I have to figure this out. Because I got to be the best person I can be. That's just me. And so it allowed me to, to see this and change this. And it allowed me to really start looking into are people overtraining? Like I stopped looking at volume or, you know, the, the programming. And all that stuff. And I went, I don't care if the program worked for somebody else. And they're like, oh, you'll never overtrain. And all the people go, you can't overtrain. You can't overtrain. Bullshit. I saw it. And I saw it because I kept my eyes open. And I listened. And I kept asking questions. And I kept educating myself. And when I saw it, I made a change. But we made the change in a way that we could actually look at it and see it. And is this working? And then, am I seeing this in more people? And I'm seeing it at everyone. I everyone, and I th and that and that was a hard education for me. I would say because I kind of was one of those people. Where here's the program. This is what you do. I got to train all the time. I got to do this. I got to go hardcore. I got to ba 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 all the time. And I had to learn to go. Listen, there is no program for everybody, and everybody's different. And the stress that we feel, whether job stress, marital stress, child stress, money stress, it affects us all very similar. So maybe you're not physically overtrained, but you have all this other stress in your life. It's still going to affect you the same way. And it's, and it's more so with the central nervous system. The muscular system will recover pretty good. And, and can you overtrain it? I still think you can overtrain it because... If you can't overtrain the muscular system, then why doesn't the carpenter's forearm continue to grow the whole time he's a carpenter? Why does it grow to one point 
and then it stays there because you're not pushing it past. You're not forcing it to grow anymore. You're just forcing it to keep doing what it's doing. So maybe that's not even the best example of that. But I mean, okay, this is here's going to be one of my over the top examples and somebody's going to get pissed off. You know, you, you take the, the, the Jews in World War II. Like, they didn't feed them, and they made them work, and they kept pushing them. Well, physically, their body couldn't keep adapting to it. Or uh, you take the beginning of the movie Conan, where he's pushing the, the Conan's wheel, and everyone else dies off, but he keeps going. Oh, bullshit. He would have failed just like everyone else. Your muscles can't just continue. They need the nutrients. They need to the sleep. They need all this stuff. You can push them beyond what they can do. But I agree that in most cases, that's a very difficult thing. I, I see the central system, the central nervous system is overtraining much faster than the muscular system. So that's kind of where I'm at. And I've actually been doing a lot of thinking over these last couple months on these subjects and training and how I can modify that. And the thing is, though, for me, because I'm not really competing anymore, I'm not saying I won't compete some more at some other stuff, but it'll never be what it was. So I want to be the best coach that I can be, and I want to help as many people as I can help. But there's this huge barrier where people have got it so sunk into their head that more is better that they need to push more and more and more. I have a sneaking suspicion this is ego. Whenever I talk to people, and almost always when I talk to athletes, especially aggressive athletes, and most of the time when I'm speaking, I'm speaking to aggressive lifters or aggressive athletes. I mean, there's, there's basically two kinds of lifters out there in my mind, and that's the ones who do not do anywhere near what they're supposed to do, and they bitch that they don't make gains. And then there's the ones that do way too freaking much. And then there's the the 1%, the great athletes, that actually, that actually have that middle point. But most people do way too much. And when I go, hey, you're probably overtraining, like they actually take it like I insulted them. I'm not overtraining. I could do, I could do more. I'm like, that's, that's not the point I'm making. I'm not, I'm not trying to insult you. You could keep going. I believe that you, there's a lot of people I know. I think there's a lot of people like me who could train so hard and so often that they end up killing themselves. Like, I believe there's a lot of people that can do that. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying you're not going to make gains if you continue to do it. I'm saying you need to let your body recover and grow. So I'm always trying to think, how can I reach people? How can I make people understand that the logic is pretty simple? You have to train with intensity to stimulate the growth. Again, we'll go back to the carpenter. His forearms don't continue to grow. And if he comes from an office job or he's never done construction, he goes out there, the first couple weeks suck because he's beat to crap and sore as shit. And eventually, his forearms get big enough that he can swing a hammer all day. And then they just, that's where they stay because that's all they're asked to do. You have to stimulate growth. And once you grow and you get stronger, then you got to stimulate it beyond what you did before to get it to grow more. The same thing with a marathon run. That's an aerobic sport. It's an endurance sport. They don't continue to grow. Their muscles grow to the point that they can go, hey, we can run for 26 miles. And then even if they want to go to them 100-mile things, their muscles will, will grow to that point. But even then, they don't grow bigger. They, they grow to the size they need to be. Then the, the muscle it gets the endurance to be able to do that. But if they don't keep running longer and longer and longer, they get to where they can run 26 miles. And that's what it's going to do. And, and then if you stop running completely, eventually you're going to lose that, but it's going to take a whole lot longer than most people think. So then beyond that stimulation of growth, now you have to let the body recover because that hard, intense training session took a lot out of your body. It's going to take nutrients. It's going to take rest. 
you know, you got to replace the hormones. You got to, you know, the stress in the lymphatic system, the stress on the muscles, the stress in the tendons, the stress on the ligaments. All that has to be replaced. But then beyond that, now you have to give the body the chance to actually grow stronger. And I think that's where the miscommunication comes in or the misunderstanding. Because a lot of people are like, oh, well, my muscles feel better. I can train again. No, you, you just got to the point where you now feel better. That means you feel like you did before. So you got your body. Your body just recovered. It didn't grow yet. It just recovered. Now you have to give it time to grow. And I look, I look back now and I go, wow, this is really similar to the concept of training if you're sick. Where a lot of people will try to train when they're sick. I used to do this because I was an idiot. Um, but then as soon as they feel better, the first day they feel better, they go train again. And then wouldn't you know it, the next day they're kind of sick again. Because their body didn't really adapt to that sickness yet it just kind of healed up and got back to where it was and this was a very hard lesson with injuries for me because I've had a lot of muscle tears where I'm like yeah feeling great today get to go train again and what do I do I tear the muscle again that that session so I learned that when when my clients or my um, teammates were sick like the first day they felt better I'm like all right Take another half a week off and you can come back to training. Or when they had an injury, they're like, oh, I feel 100%. I'm like, is the first day you feel 100%? They're like, yeah. I go, all right. Three to five days and then come back in. You know, because first of all, you're not going to lose anything in three to five days. But you might as well let your body fully recover. A lot of times it recovers and we think we're 100%, but we're not. And it's the same thing with training. If I go in and train heavy tonight and then tomorrow, I don't feel too bad. The next day I'm sore and then the next day, a little bit of soreness. And then the next day I'm like, all right, man, I'm dude, not, not sore. I feel good. I, I just recovered. Like my, if my body took three days to recover, how many days do you think it's going to take to grow? It's not going to happen in an hour. Like it's still going to take some time. And I think a lot of people are too scared to spread their training out to take those days off because of this insane idea, like these insane concepts that are out there that you got to train every day and that you got to do all these things. And we're not looking at this logically and what the body actually has to do. And we're also not looking at the systemic effect of intense training. If you're like most people and you go into the gym and like you're on the phone 70% of the time you're in the gym, and you're talking another 20%, and you're actually only training 10%, and even when you're training, you're never doing anything heavy or even close to failure, yeah, go in the gym every day, dude. You're not going to have an issue. But if you go in there and you train with intensity, and you train with focus and intent, it's going to impact your body. It's going to have a systemic effect throughout your whole body, just like any other stress. Only more because now you're stressing your muscles and your mind and your central nervous system. Like you're putting everything into it. Because you're not going to go in and do a truly intense training session without exhausting your brain. And how long does that take to recover from? And then the caveat is it's different for everybody. And so this is where I get a little frustrated with people who continue to compare themselves with everyone else. If you're comparing yourself to a very gifted genetic athlete, most likely they're going to recover way faster than you. So you're going to do their program, and quite possibly you're going to end up going, oh, well, they're just a genetic freak. Oh, they're on drugs. You're going to make every excuse under the book. And you're like, I work harder than they do. And I actually added a day in because I wasn't making gains. And I'm still not making any gains. Yeah. Did you try taking a couple more days off and see what happened there? 
Did you try taking, instead of one day off after every session, taking two or three days off after every session? Like, I'm convinced anyone can get bigger. To what level? I don't know. It depends on how dedicated you are. But a lot of times, people make excuses for everyone else doing good when they when they just don't, they don't take the time to realize, well, maybe we have different genetics. Maybe I can't take the exact path that he's taking. But what does he do... What knowledge does he have that I can take away from this and become a better lifter myself and make better gains? Like stop trying to break people down and instead try to find out what information you can take. What principles do they follow? And am I following those principles? And that's a tough thing to do. That's a very tough thing to do. One of the problems I made in my career, well, first of all, one of the hardest things I ever did to become a world-class power lifter was taking more time away from the gym. That sucked and it was hard. I wanted to be in a gym at least six days a week and I wanted to train my ass off every one of those days. And that was getting me nowhere. And luckily I had some mentors and some guys that kind of said, hey, you know, you have all these ideas, why aren't you doing them? And, I, and why didn't I do them? I didn't do them because nobody else was doing them. So I thought I must be wrong. The funny part is, is later on I found out there are guys that were doing the same thing. I just didn't have access to, to what they were. To, I didn't have access to find out what they were doing to, to s- compare it to me. But even at that, I did start backing off and I start getting better. Start got betting be- I started getting better. And I backed off a little more. And now all of a sudden I'm world class. And you know what happens? I'm getting shit on all the forums. I'm getting shit from so many lifters. Chad's a genetic freak. Like he just he lifts like one day a week and he's strong as hell. And it's like, well, I'm not lifting one day a week. I'm lifting two days a week heavy and a couple days doing GPP. But they didn't want to listen to what I was trying to tell them. You know, they would basically say that stuff, and I thought it was funny, and I would comment back, well, who won the meet? Like, who's got the bigger total? And they would make excuses for why I had the bigger total instead of going, wait a minute, how did Chad do that? Or really looking at me and going, wait a minute, Chad's not doing any drugs. Depending on what part of my career you're going through, I did do steroids at one point because I had low testosterone. Um, He doesn't sleep. He has sleep studies to prove how fucked up his sleep is, yet he's this strong. How is that happening? And instead of jumping to some conclusion, they could have asked me. They could have listened to me. I told many of them, I go, listen, you're overtraining and you're beating the crap out of yourself, but you've done it for so long that you don't know it. I go, let me help you. Let me. I was always willing to help all of these people, but they didn't want to listen because... No one else was doing it or very few people were doing it. And the people that were doing it probably weren't talking about it because they didn't want to get the shit that I was getting. And the, and the, the funny part to that is there was a point where I went, man, like I'm, I'm still doing too much. Like I need to back off even more. And I didn't want to recognize it because I had already backed off way more than everyone else. And I convinced myself, I lied to myself. No, it can't be. Like, that would be too, I would be undertrained. I can't back off that much. Because I was scared. Because my ego wouldn't let me. When that, If I would have did that, I would have put up some damn serious numbers, man. <laughs> Like I would have put up some crazy numbers and I would have been way healthier and I wouldn't have had to stop because my depression was so bad I wanted to kill myself. Like I put myself in all those positions and I know that now. Didn't know it at the time. And that's kind of my mission. That's why I try to spend time doing these podcasts. And that's why I go out of my way trying to grow this thing so I can reach more people. How can I reach more people and make them understand like, how can I make them see, listen, I know this because I've experienced it. And, I'm at, and I've experienced it because I'm at the serious far end of it. So what I do, very few people need to back down that much. Because if you sleep, 
you do not need to back down as much as I do. But my principles and my theories are still sound. It's just a matter of fitting them in. When I trained, all of my partners always got stronger. One of my guys was putting up damn near 2,400 pounds drug-free total. And he had other things in his life. He wanted to start a family and kids and do all that. But he could have been one of the best truly drug-free power lifters of all time. I mean, the only person I know that drug-free put up bigger numbers was me. And he could have beat me. Because he slept better. Because he had better genetics. And I had stopped, I had caught him when he was young enough. Before he completely beat the crap out of himself. And I dedicated myself to making his hard-headed, hard-headed ass understand it. Which, by the way, I actually had to bet him to start training with me because I, the things I was doing was so different. He didn't want to try it, um, so I beat him in a bet, and then he had to do it. <laughs> so these these things that I go through, they're a gift, and it's it's almost like I and I will say in a way I need to do this. I need to try and coach people. I need to try and help people. Because it actually makes, for me, it makes it worth it. Like, yeah, I went through all this shit. It sucked. It was horrible. It was miserable. There's so many horrible, bad times in my life. But if I can make something positive come from that, then it's okay. If nothing positive comes from it, it's pretty crappy. So I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap this podcast up kind of being the first one back. And hopefully the people listening would just think about this. Like the reason I come out here, the reason I talk, the reason I talk about things that are so personal and so horrible is because it really does matter to me and it really does mean something to me. And I want to make a positive change and I want to help people possibly avoid this situation and the people that are going through it, I want to help them get out of it. I want to help them see that they do have some control. I want to help them figure out what I figured out only a whole lot faster. And that depending on the level of your depression, depending on what's going on in your life, there's always a way, there's always triggers, there's always signs But we have to open up our eyes and we have to open up our minds and we have to check our ego and really look at things from an outside standpoint, from a logical standpoint. We need to take the emotion out of it. And I'm not saying never be emotional because I love emotions and emotions can be amazing, but I would rather choose to feel the positive ones and use my logic instead of feeling the negative ones. Unless I can use the negative ones. Sometimes I can use those too. So that's it. Thanks for listening. I'm going to try to get back to at least once a week. I still have, I have so many awesome, amazing friends that I would love to interview and get on here and share some of their knowledge with you guys. Uh, So please um, share the podcast. If you'd like it, help me grow it. I'm really trying to get to a point where like here, okay, this is part of my income doing this. So, I need to make sure to do it every week. And if I make it a little money doing this, I can back off some of the other jobs that I don't feel are as positive for the world um, and people out there. Um, Such as putting in granite countertops. It's really cool and people seem to really like my work, but um, it's not all that fulfilling to me. Other than the fact that I like using my hands and I like making stuff. I would rather spend that time trying to help people achieve their goals and reach their goals and and, and fight mental disorders and, and just make people's lives better. Until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for listening to the Courage Barbell Unlimited podcast. For more information, please visit couragebarbell.com. Until next time.